And then as we turn to our topic for today, which is thinking about the gospel. And the reason I say it's apropos, in the end, the best way to overcome many of the things that we are talking about and that we heard about in the announcement is a change of heart. And a change of heart by the gospel is what God offers to redirect people, to recalibrate people, to make them new creations, and to make them, give them the ability um, to walk fully with God because of the gift, not only of forgiveness of sins, but the gift of the Spirit that indwells us and enables us to walk with God, a la Romans 6 through 8. Um, So if you have questions as we proceed, um, the number is up on the screen, 419-777-5218. If you'll um, text that number with your question as we speak, uh, we'll be glad to engage with you. So my guests today are two distinguished alums of Dallas Theological Seminary. And I'm from the South, so ladies go first. Nika Spaulding is a proud graduate. That's an important qualification. Of both the University of Oklahoma with a bachelor's in zoology, the normal qualifications for theology, and, uh, and Dallas Theological Seminary with a master's theology in New Testament. Several years she served as women's minister in North Dallas and now is uh, serving at, in Oak Cliff at St. Jude Oak Cliff where she is resident theologian. She loves cheering on her Sooners, paying with her cl- playing with her cat Clive, and enjoying a good meal with her friends. So, Nika, thank you for joining us here on the Cultural Engagement Chapel. And then Travis Cook. Uh, this, is, this introduction is going to be hard because Kim works in our office. But Travis is originally from Marietta, Georgia. He enjoys digging into the lives of those in the church through discipleship and bringing God's Word to life with creativity and depth in his lessons and sermons. He was, he's been minister of single adults at Park City's Baptist Church since 2012 and took on the additional role of being the teaching pastor in 2018. He uh, walks alongside soldiers as a chaplain in the United States Army Reserves. And besides strengthening the church, Travis deeply loves reading, trivia, baseball, his wife and his two little ones. And why they trail at the end, I do not know. So uh, anyway, um, Travis, uh, thank you for being a part of our Cultural Engagement Chapel. I'm going to dive right in. Our topic is the gospel. And the way I'm going to dive in is I'm going to ask each of you how the gospel, or at least how do you remember the gospel being presented to you as you came to the Lord? And so, Nike, I'll let you go first. How was the gospel presented to you when you came to the Lord? Yeah, it started with I'm a sinner, which felt uh, a little presumptuous because I thought I was pretty great. And uh, and then it was a hard then left step straight to Jesus uh, through the Romans road. And so it was I just remember you're a sinner. Jesus saves sinners. And then if you want, he'll save you. Uh, And that was really the end of it. It's just then I get to wait. And then someday when I die, I get to go to heaven. And it worked, so I'm grateful it worked. Uh, but you can imagine my delight when I found out there was more to it than that. But that was that was really the presentation when I got saved. Okay, and Travis, how did you hear about the gospel? Being, being deeply in, ensconced in the Baptist church, I'm just curious to hear how you heard about the gospel. Yeah, yeah, it was it was very similar. Um, uh, again, largely from, from the pulpit, uh, you know, sitting in, sitting in a pew each week. Uh, and, and hearing again and again and again, uh, Micah, very similar uh, to what you, you said as well. There was, there was the hell element as well, like, hey, uh, and, and, you know, when people talked about heaven at the time, uh, they, they kept saying it was one big church service, one big long worship service. Well, as a kid, I didn't like church, mm-hmm. but it beat the alternative. Uh, and so I was like, well, yeah, like that sounds better. Um, and so I distinctly remember uh, just, just feeling guilty that like, yeah, I don't really, like, I don't want to go to hell. But heaven doesn't sound exciting either, like as a seven year old kid. So <laughs> it was um, it was it's been it, it was a struggle at, at the time. But, yeah, I, I distinctly remember uh, being told that I was I was alienated from God. And, um, and that word was used. And, uh, but but again, as Nika said, kind of growing up in the faith and realizing there was so much more uh, has been very refreshing uh, to a, a seven year old kid. Well, um, I'll share my story. Um, actually, the first person to present the gospel to me is now Dean of Students at Talbot Seminary, Scott Ray. 
He had just come back from a Young Life uh, uh, camp. He was in eighth grade. I was in ninth grade. And his message was three words. You need Jesus. And he was able to say it three ways. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. You need <laughs> Jesus. Okay? And uh, he, there was a little bit of sin in there, but really it was just, you need Jesus. That was about all he could tell me. I thought he had absolutely lost his mind. And even though he was a good, dear friend, and we've been dear friends for life, in that first journey, I thought, what in the world has happened to my friend? So, um, so that's my experience. What we're here to discuss is thinking through how we present the gospel today. And what I want to do is I want to work from uh, uh, two models. I'm, I'm going to discuss two models. One is what I call the Genesis 3 model that starts with sin. And the other is what I'm going to call the Genesis 1 model that starts with creation. Okay? So we just want to think about this. And this is, don't hear this wrong. This is not a, this is not a uh, bad and great combination. This is the way in which we talk about the gospel in the public and thinking about that and how we do it. And I'm going to start with 1 Corinthians 15 and ask uh, uh, Travis and then Nika, how do you view 1 Corinthians 15? Because most people, when we talk about the gospel, that's the passage they go to and they say, 1 Corinthians 15 defines the gospel. And so that's what the gospel is, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, so what do we have about the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, and how should we think about 1 Corinthians 15 when we think about the gospel? Travis, I'll let you start. Yeah, um, I mean, I think with, with 1 Corinthians 15, uh, one, it's one of my favorite passages uh, in Scripture. Um, I, I think there's a lot of beauty uh, there. Uh, I also think that people miss, um, when they go there, they miss kind of, the resurrection component of it. Amazingly enough, right? They, they miss the, the part about the resurrection. I, I can't count the number of times that I've shared uh, from the pulpit. Uh, we've talked about the, the new heaven and the new earth and that the goal of our faith is not uh, this disembodied existence. It's, uh, it's something, something greater uh, than that. It's, it's new heaven, new earth, you know, resurrected bodies in the, in the flesh and um, with a resurrected Lord. And, and I've had people come up to me, longtime church members come up to me afterwards and say, it, it is so encouraging to know that this is the goal of our faith, that, that it's not this like disembodied on a cloud, you know, playing a harp kind of, uh, kind of thing. And so, um, so I think one of the things that, that when we go from a First Corinthians 15 model is that we truncate it, we, we, we shorten it down uh, to make it where we can communicate the kind of one verse evangelism style of, of, of presentation. But when we do that, we don't actually get to the, the, what I would call the good part, like the exciting part. Like, yeah, heaven sounds great. Um, but, but there was more. And, and if somebody had told me that as a seven year old, I think, I think I would have had a lot less, um, what's the word, a lot less, uh, confusion perhaps over, over the good news of the gospel hmm. uh, myself. Nika? So how do you see First Corinthians 15? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a contextualized passage, right? And so Paul is addressing this church who he has a relationship with and addressing this issue of if there is no resurrection, then there is no salvation, which is so essential. And so I think uh, if you're going to present the gospel and it doesn't include the resurrection, then you don't have a gospel. But I would not come to 1 Corinthians 15 and say this is the summation of all that the gospel entails. I would just say he's addressing something very particular with a group of people who's saying there's no resurrection of the dead. And he's saying, listen, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then we will not be raised up and death will have its victory. And instead, we get to dance on death's grave, so to speak. And so I think 1 Corinthians 15 is essential to our understanding of the gospel, but I would not say it's the gospel. And I think that has sometimes been made, the, the 1 Corinthians 15, the Romans Road, that's been made into the gospel. Whereas I would say this is a contextualized conversation that's happening here. Very important one, but not the entirety of it. Yeah, when I look at 1 Corinthians 15, I see the hub facts that lead into the gospel. You know, that Jesus yeah. died for sin, that he was raised third day, that those things took place according to Scripture. This was a program and plan of God, which the resurrection is the end point. But there's nothing about how to respond to that message in that chapter. So, so it gives us the core kind of historical 
and theological base for the gospel, and it operates as a hub, but it doesn't exhaust what the gospel is about. So let's take a, let's take a step back. And uh, we, you've mentioned the Roman road. The Roman road definitely is an approach to the gospel that goes through, um, through the Genesis 3 um, highway. We'll say it that way. Um, because it starts with sin and everyone's need in Romans 1 to 3, and then you get justified in the middle portion, and then you get sanctified in Romans 6 to 8. But I want to point something out about this text, uh, this epistle and this presentation of the gospel, and that is the theme verse in Romans 1.16. Mm-hmm. Okay? Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And then it goes on to talk about to the Jew first and to the Greek. Here's, here's, here's the way I read this passage for years. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the salvation of God to the Jew first and the Greek. I didn't know what the word power was doing in that verse. So my question for you is, why, out of all the words that Paul could pick to summarize why he's not ashamed of the gospel, why does he pick the word power, and why does that make the gospel good news? Hmm. Yeah, I think that in order for the gospel to be good news, it has to be effective to restore so much of what's been broken. And I think that when you're talking about a cosmic restoration as well as relational restoration, you it cannot just be this uh, transactional thing that happens where then humans are saved, but rather this complete, holistic, cosmic thing that's taken place at, at the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so I think that power there is, is necessary for us to be able to declare what it is in actuality that God has really done in sending his son and then, then sending the spirit together. Okay, so the backside of that is, is when we ask the question, what is salvation for? What does it do? What does it accomplish? It not only accomplishes my personal salvation, it accomplishes this cosmic restoration. Travis, where do you see that in Romans? How is that an introductory verse to what's going on in the rest of Romans uh, 1 to 8? Yeah, yeah. Romans Romans 8 especially is, is you know, all of creation crying out, groaning alongside of us, um, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God to be revealed. And, and, uh, and, and I think, again, uh, we, we see just a lack of, of a holistic presentation of the gospel, that the gospel, the gospel isn't just good news uh, for human beings. It's a good news for creation. It's a good news for the world, uh, for God so loved the world, uh, right? So we're going, we're going to find another uh, one verse evangelism, John 3, 16. I'm actually preaching that this week. Um, you know, it's, 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 this, it's the entire world uh, and, and, and the idea of it being powerful. Uh, is is I think critical for for Paul as well. That's why there's it's, shame and power seem to have antithetical relationships, right? So if if I'm ashamed of something, that implies like a powerlessness. And so the reason why Paul can cannot be ashamed of the gospel is because it's powerful uh, and it has this amazing ability uh, not just to transform individuals who are dead um, and to bring them to life again, but to take creation uh, which is cursed. And and uh, just groaning and striving uh, within itself and against itself and against um, its creator, uh, and, and to transform it and set it free as well. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's a it's an amazingly powerful theme verse and does set the course, especially for those first eight chapters, as you said. So what I'm hearing is is that when we think about power, we're thinking uh, even though we start with sin in Romans one to three, we're really arriving at a place that's about restoration and a total restoration, which begs the question: rest- If we're thinking about restoration or fixing brokenness, I think is how Nika said it, then. That, that moves us beyond Genesis 3. That takes us, if you will, back to Genesis 1. So, the, and this is actually the point of the conversation, is to say that what makes the gospel good news is not merely that my sins are covered, okay, and which is the challenge of the gospel. When you share the gospel, and as Nika said, when she first heard she was a sinner, that was kind of like a slap in the face because I thought, well, I'm actually a pretty good person. You know, there's the challenge of the gospel, but then there's the invitation that makes it good news. Mm-hmm. And what makes it invitation to good news is this restoration piece and this what I will call the enablement piece. That's Romans 6 to 8. 
Romans 6 to 8 is the idea that I've been given as a result of justification the Spirit of God in such a way that I am now able to walk with God. I have a capability or enablement. Think of power as enablement. An enablement to walk with God that I did not possess when I was dead in my trespasses and sins because how much power does a dead person have? Okay, that's calculus. You need a PhD to figure that one out. <laughs> so um, so that's, that's the picture. So when we push to restoration, what, is, what does that do for us in thinking about the presentation of the gospel today in a largely secular, um, estranged society? Nika, that's my, that's my question for you, my next question for you. How does, how does rooting the gospel in Genesis 1 to get to Genesis 3, how does that help us? Uh, tremendously, and especially when I'm talking to young people, I, to be able to start the gospel presentation with, this is a God-made world, and it it speaks of his generosity, his extravagance. Like, I have a zoology degree, and <laughs> I went to the zoo last week, and I it never seeks to amaze. I am constantly amazed at God's extravagance in the animal kingdom. Um, I live right by the Dallas Zoo, so I see the giraffes and elephants almost every day, multiple times a day. And to be able to start by making inroads with people with that, that I think you can uh, you can talk to people about, there's a world of beauty and goodness. And yes, we had hail last night. Yes, we had a massive freeze a couple of weeks ago, which we can talk about when we get to Genesis 3. But to start with, this is a God-made world. And because God is abundant and extravagant and generous, and it came from an overflow of a loving Trinitarian relationship, what you're experiencing in this world of beauty and goodness is from a God who loves you and created this for you to participate in and delight in and to be nourished by. And that allows you to start making inroads before you pivot to Genesis 3. And sometimes you have to make those inroads because you might meet somebody as arrogant as me who's not that convinced that they're that broken. And so to be able to get them to agree with you that this is a good, beautiful world at its best that was created by a good and beautiful God out of the overflow of his love allows you to have a conversation about the goodness of God and the beauty of God and the love of God and the extravagance of God before you pivot into, but there's something broken. That's interesting because yesterday I did a podcast with a person who came to the Lord through biochemistry, believe it or not. Now we were talking about we were talking about transhumanism, and in the midst of it, uh, he does a work as a biochemist. And he said, when he was in graduate school, he was a Muslim in background, and he said, when I realized the way in which life is balanced biologically and the intricacy of the design of what is going on in the creation. It, that led me to the conclusion there must be a God. And he was I often running towards the gospel. So this idea of, of a created world that is designed and ordered by a creator God as the launching point. By the way, that's exactly where Paul starts at Mars Hill. Okay, he talks about the creator God to whom we are accountable. That's how he makes the transition from Genesis 1 to Genesis 3. And so this idea of, of we are designed for relationship with God, rooted in the image of God, that's where I want to go with you next, Travis. Let's, let's talk about the creation mandate and what being made in the image of God has to offer to the gospel when we think about restoration. How do you put those ideas together? Yeah, if you if you don't have, um, we, we often talk a lot about being saved from. So saved from sin, saved from destruction, saved from. But we don't often talk about like what we're being saved to. And so if you use the word restoration, that implies that you are going from a state back to a state prior, prior, right? So so if you don't talk to somebody about the the Genesis one and the mandate and the image bearing and and, and that component. Uh, and include there for that person that you're speaking with, uh, that when we talk about creation being good, that includes human beings. Human beings are good. Now, again, not not in a uh, we're also sinful and broken and, and need restoration, but like we are good in God's eyes as far as being created beings. So obviously there's a tension there that you have to walk, but including human beings in there and saying like God loves humanity and desires them to be restored and restored back to and even beyond and this sort of, sort of Eden 2.0 kind of kind of uh, situation that'll obviously hopefully have clothing. Uh, nobody wants to see me for eternity with my shirt off. Um, so like, let's just let's just go with that. Um, but but I think the restoration piece is so critical um, because if you're going to use that word, you have to lay the groundwork for what we're being restored uh, to. 
And if you don't, if you start in Genesis three and you don't cultivate the idea of image bearing and you don't, you don't explain that, that the reason why the person you're speaking with or the reason why the, the group you're communicating with feels a sense of purposelessness in their life or feels a sense of, of aimlessness or feels a sense of tragedy in their life that they aren't, it's because they're not fulfilling this idea that they were created to bear the image of God. And that doesn't sometimes doesn't mean a big shift in their life. It just means a, a change in motivation and then the transformation of the gospel uh, coming in behind it. Now, I'm going to remind people that you can text in questions uh, 419-777-5218. Uh, that's uh, 419-777-5218. Uh, this is an important discussion. Let me add an ethical element to this that I think is important um, in thinking about Genesis 1. I'll get your reaction to this. Um, when we think of the creation mandate and we look at how creation functions, how it's designed to function, because we made a point here, it's a restoration, it's a restoration to a God of order, a God of design. Um, that that what the creation mandate asks of us is to be fruitful and multiply. That's the part everyone knows. But then it goes on to say and and, and rule over you know the creation, this stewardship, this management of the creation and the way in which creation works in Genesis 1, I think this is beautiful, is you have the creation of Adam and then you have the creation of Eve and the creation gets promoted from good to very good once you have man and woman collaborating together side by side to manage this creation well. So we were created in the image of God, to image God by showing that collaboration and that cooperation that manages things creatively well. This is part of the truth and beauty element of what we're talking about. And Nike, I'll start with you. The, the question that I have here is, how does the creation mandate build towards this, this ethical commitment that the Bible has that lands us eventually into the combination of the Great Commission and the Great Commandment? I mean, when I think about the Great Commandment, that's kind of the ultimate in collaboration. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. We're under under him, responsive to him, but we're all supposed to love, love our neighbor as ourselves, which I see ultimately as a way of allowing us to collaborate with one another. Let's talk about the ethical um, dimensions that grow out of the gospel. Nika, how do you respond yeah, to what Genesis it. 1 does for us there? Yeah, I think when, because it becomes very good when both Adam and Eve are there, which as a woman I especially appreciate, I think the ethical component of that becomes this understanding that because we're made in the image of a Trinitarian God who existed in community prior to creation, then there's an ethical component that we need each other. Like there is a mutual dependence on each other for there to be thriving, and that's part of it. And then I think together, we not only do we need each other as part of the image bearers of God, but since we've been given this right to rule, so often I think people think of dominion as domination. And I think young people who are starting to realize we're, we're killing this earth and we're killing creation and we're killing ourselves and we're killing so much. It's more stewardship. And in order for us to effectively do that, we have to do that in partnership with each other, in partnership, of course, with the Lord and energizing and enabling us to do that, but then also in partnership with creation, that it's not domination, but it's it's servanthood and it's it's stewarding in a way that reflects what God created in the beginning of Genesis 1 and 2. And so I think the ethical implication I tell people, I tell men when I get the opportunity to speak to men is that you need me and then I wait long enough and then I go, and I need you. And so there's this, <laughs> this idea that we really do need each other in order to fulfill what God has done, which means we need community. We need to trust each other. We need to love and serve and help each other. And we need to do so with the mind of wanting to see flourishing both among the human world, so to speak, but also among the created world. Because I don't think you can have human flourishing if the created world is also not flourishing. Okay, and Travis, I'll let, I'll let you um, take this uh, from a slightly different angle, which goes something like this. So when we look at this way in which we've been called to live, and we see the gospel as restoring us and giving us the capability to live, how does the gospel step into a culture, into a challenge like the one that we are currently facing? How, why, you know, sometimes people say, well, the gospel is kind of an interesting kind of privatized thing over here. Um, uh, and yet our argument would be that the gospel is central and essential to, to stepping into the very environment we find ourselves in. How do you think that works? Yeah, the, um, 
I don't think you have to spend a lot of time convincing people that the world we live in is broken, <laughs> that there are that there are things going wrong. Again, the the news media uh, gives us a healthy dose of that, you know, pretty much twenty four seven. And so, the as we were talking about the Genesis one versus the Genesis three sort of model, um, you don't have to spend a lot of time convincing people uh, of that, and because of that. Uh, you can then sort of progressively move people towards, there has to be a solution. There has to be a solution coming from outside of uh, humanity. We, we try different things. We, we you know, uh, we talk about this, this system, like uh, what was it? Churchill said that democracy is the best system. Um, uh, it, it, democracy is the worst system, but it's better than all the others uh, kind of concept. Like, like it's the best thing we can come up with. And it's still deeply flawed um, because it's, Sinners made it, like broken people made it. Uh, and so when we, when we approach the gospel, we, we share, we, we have a solution as to one, why things perhaps are the way that they are. But then also to say, hey, we, we uh, through the, the, what you were speaking of, the, the love God, love others, uh, if we put that and make that central uh, to ourselves and the gospel allows us to do that, and then then you begin to see this this restoration uh, sort of take place uh, throughout throughout the community and throughout uh, throughout the world. Hopefully, okay. I'm going to transition to student questions here, and I'll let either one of you take this who wants to uh, leap at the opportunity to speak to this. It says, "I often say we are not just saved from something, but for something." You're suggesting to lead with the for prior to the from. Agreed. How important is is it for us? to have that as a winsome engagement in today's angry culture. And I will send the money to the person who asked this question later. That's a great question. Um, uh, so how, how, why, what is the advantage of getting to Genesis 3 through Genesis 1? Let me ask it that way. <laughs> Yeah, I think when we talk about salvation, we have been reading so much about the idea of atonement and what, how we talk about atonement. And uh, Scott McKnight said in one of his books, if you're going to talk about the atonement and not mention the kingdom, I, I don't remember his exact words, but basically there's a malpractice here. We are saved by a king into a kingdom with a kingdom ethic. And when you begin to talk about that, that transforms your entire life, not just your personal quiet times with the Lord, but how you engage in your community, how you engage in politics, how you engage on social media, how, because you ultimately serve at the pleasure of King Jesus within his kingdom. And it's a holistic whole world kingdom that we're all aliens in this world of, but we belong to a real kingdom. And there's a kingdom ethic uh, that seeks justice and loves mercy. There's a kingdom ethic that says when you have the spirit in you, you have love, joy, peace, patience, all of that. And so in order for people to want to be a part of this kingdom and to see that this king is different than every other king slash ruler slash president slash, you know, MP, whatever, his people, when they engage in that kingdom ethic, his kingdom becomes a true invitation into something different and beautiful. And that has to be a holistic life lived out gospel approach. And so if it's just Genesis three, then the question is what's broken? It's me, now I'm fixed, we're good. But if it's, hey, there's a whole world that God's created, this is all his place. We serve at his pleasure and it's a whole world redemption. Then your entire life is shaped by the gospel, which means we have to stop screaming at each other. We actually have to learn to love and serve even in our disagreements and to allow the gospel to work out in every area of our life from where we shop, where we, how we spend our money, where we spend our time, how we engage on the internet. It's, it's crazy to me that some Christians, their behavior on the internet is shocking. Uh, and I'm like, you know, Jesus reads those tweets. Like, you know that, right? And so, uh, yeah, I think if you, you gotta get the whole gospel involved talking about a kingdom. Yeah. Travis, I'm not sure you can add to Jesus reading tweets, but anyway. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think, I think I, I got to quit following. I think doing great. Um, no, the, uh, I, think you're, I think you're absolutely correct. Being saved for something. I think young adults uh, in particular uh, have a deep sense of optimism uh, as opposed to previous generations. I think previous generations have felt like the world's broken. We're going to do what we can. And we'll just wait, you know, especially Christians would say, and, and, but it's all going to burn. So who cares? You know, like, let's just move on. 
Uh, but but young adults, millennials, Gen Z, there's this this sense of of optimism and hope. Uh, and so if you can 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 come in with the gospel uh, exactly as Micah said and said and, and explain that it's a whole life like Jesus is asking you to follow him with everything that you have. And there's grace for when you fail to do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then. Then I think, again, the gospel becomes good news and and the person hearing that their optimism becomes validated. It may be it may have been misplaced, but you can say, hey, you know why you're hopeful? Uh, it's misplaced right now. But but if you look at the cross, if you look at what God's trying to do uh, throughout history, there's actually a reason to be excited. There's a reason to be hopeful. And and he wants you to be a part of of making the area that you live in, the world you live in, the, 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 the corner of the kingdom that, that he wants you a part of, make it more like his kingdom uh, where he can rule and reign. That, that, that may it be on earth as it is in heaven uh, is, is, is a request uh, that I think God often fulfills through his people. Uh, and so you have an invitation to do that. You know, when I think about, when I think about the gospel and I, and I think about the gospel of grace, which is what we're talking about, um, obviously you get drawn to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and uh, people at the school here have a, have a love relationship with the book of Ephesians since we all are required <laughs> to work through it in whole. But I, I really like the way 2, 8 and 9 move into 2, 10. That's right. You know, um, you know, say by grace through faith, not of you know, it's not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then two ten trails along, sometimes gets forgotten, but it trails along and it says, For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that we should walk in them. And then of course the one theme that comes from Ephesians four to six is the theme of the walk. Mm-hmm. Walk in love, walk in unity. Walk not as the Gentiles, you know, um, and, and so and, and it's holistic. I mean, it, it, it is dealing with the relationships, the fruit of the spirit. I like to point this out too. the fruit of the spirit ultimately is relational love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc. It's primarily relational. So so we're we're fixed at the level of being able to relate to one another in a healthy way in the midst of a broken world. Uh, and we're designed, we were originally designed to be that. The restoration is designed to take you back to that. Um, I think that's just a powerful way to speak to people who look around them and say, man, the world's a mess. It's broken. And so to have the gospel be about good news, not just about my salvation, but about restoration in the full sense of that term, relational restoration as well, both with God and with others, which puts you right in the great commandment, is a powerful way to think about what the gospel is about. I just think it's a, it's a, it's a good way to think about what God is doing in the gospel. I've got to turn my thing back on to get to my question. So give me a second here. Let me go to the next question. Your point on restoration is crucial for sharing the gospel with a world where honor and shame and community are central to their worldview perspective. How can Americans more effectively engage others with the gospel, being a country where innocence guilt culture is a core value, driving, uh, driving law more than grace, and restoration in relationship with God and community? I'm not, I may have gotten lost in the second half of that question, but I think I get the difference. What does... What, what does having a, a sense of community and a corporateness do for the gospel in an honor-shame context that maybe our innocence and guilt culture, our more um, forensic way of talking about the gospel, or the transactional way of talking about the gospel, may not quite reach at? Um, Travis, I'll let you start with that. Do you, do you, do you have to? No. <laughs> um, whew, that's a mouthful. Um, yeah, so so I think um, having grown up in church, I I remember a large amount of of guilt, even after being saved, and and feeling bad um, if I wasn't, you know, as the, as the Hebrews passage like there, there's you know there's no more. Uh, no more forgiveness of sins, you know, and just this idea of feeling like, 
have I screwed up? Like, like I'm not consistent in, in my walk with the Lord and not recognizing that grace really does pervade uh, the entire walk with Christ, not just the justification experience, but grace is also there for sanctification. Grace is there at glorification. And, and so I think if I'm understanding the question correct, which is a largely large if, uh, <laughs> just going to be honest, um, I think shame comes, I think shame, we, we've weaponized it mm-hmm. and we've used it as a means in which uh, to cajole uh, people into being good little Christians. Um, and good little people. And, and we still use it. I mean, our cultures use it. Governments use it. Like everybody uses it. But going back to the Romans 1.16 that we started with, uh, the power of the gospel, uh, I, th- I think for some people, they think the power of the gospel is to make them feel guilty to the point where they don't do anything wrong again. Hmm. And, and it's because they've been hit with the shame stick or, or they, 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 they misunderstood. And again, I, I think I lived in that for a while, particularly in my teenage years. Uh, and, and so I would say that, that uh, if you're really thinking about repentance and what confession and repentance looks like, as I've learned and studied, I, I feel like I've genuinely repented and I've genuinely confessed when the shame and the guilt is gone and there's this feeling of, of closeness with the Lord. Uh, that is, that is when I feel, uh, again, as basing it largely on emotions at that point, but like, there's this sense of like, no, I've genuinely confessed. I've genuinely, uh, so, so shame is just a, and again, I'm, I'm kind of wandering here, but, but shame has a, doesn't have a place, I think, uh, in, in the gospel. Um, that's one of the things we've been rescued from. Okay. Nika, so that's one of the things please. that cross covers. <laughs> Nika, you want to take a shot at this? Yeah, I'd say one, I would really pay attention to Gen Z and millennials because we might be headed towards an honor shame culture. So I think as you consider your evangelism, social media is doing some stuff. If you right now, the soul of shame, Brene Brown, shame, everything I talk about with young people is about shame. So I actually would say that. But for discipling older generations, I understand that guilt in a sense paradigm that they have. And I would I would then encourage you to disciple them towards a communal understanding of, of the, the y'alls in scripture, right? I think DTS, didn't y'all create the y'all Bible? I think helping them see there's a y'all component <laughs> yeah. to all of this. Yeah. And then and then that, and just if you can do that, then there's a, because of the systems that we participate in that are broken, then there's a corporate guilt as well, which means we need a corporate help in that. And so I think if you're truly dealing with somebody who lives out of the paradigm of a, of a guilt innocence, I, I would disciple them towards y'all, you know, the y'all understanding of things. And then I would say for young people, you may be surprised by how much uh, the tools to address honor and shame work with young people because they, they feel shame. When that whole idea of I didn't do something wrong, I am wrong, I'm seeing that in young people. And I think with some of my older people, I'm like, no, no, you did wrong. No, I didn't do wrong. Yes, you did. You did, you know, and then (laughs) that way you can kind of, it's all, it's all contextualized in the gospel. So I don't have simple answers, but I think pay attention to the shifts that we're seeing in these generations below us or below me. I, some of y'all might be younger than me at DTS. It's below me. That's for sure. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) uh, One last question. I'm going to take this one myself. Uh, It says, how can I reconcile both the Imago Dei, image of God, in the lowly state of sin in a person? Mm-hmm. The answer is simple. That is the cross. Mm-hmm. Yes. That is the cross. What the cross does is reconcile the image of God in restoration by dealing with the problem of sin, not just in the person, okay, but between peoples as well. Mm-hmm. And so... Uh, You know, when we talk about the gospel fundamentally aimed at restoration, taking us back to the design of God, the way God made us, re-imaging the image of God that God has made in us, that's where the gospel takes us. I think that's a very exciting and intriguing way to present the gospel to people, particularly people who haven't darkened the, the door of a church and have no idea what what the gospel is about. And the other thing that it does that's beautiful is it keeps the focus on the gospel at good news. And we should always present the gospel in such a way that it's clear why it's called the gospel and why it's called good news. So with that, I'm going to close. Let's thank our guests for our time together.
Let me close this in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank You for the good news that You made us in Your image and You never let us go. You never let us go because You so loved the world that You gave Your Son so that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And that eternal life is to know the Father and to know the Son, to have the Spirit indwelling, to be able to image You in a way that is honoring to You, that manages creation well, and allows us to walk with one another side by side in a deep love that loves You with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and loves our neighbor as ourselves. That is the answer for a broken not just person and soul, but for a broken society. May we not only teach it, but reflect it in a way that people can see your goodness through the way we represent you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.